thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk to present our work. It's really a great honor. And thank you very much for coming in early in the morning. So uh, first, a brief motivation of why we want to image deep and fast in the brain. If you look at this, this is the sagittal plane of the mouse brain, right, like this. It's about one cubic centimeter. And on 2005, you can see this yellow box is roughly what we can do with high resolution optical imaging, seeing single cell resolution. Clearly, when I was transitioning out from telecom into imaging, this is no brainer. You want to image much deeper, much wider, and much faster. For example, can we double in the uh, 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 penetration depth? Of course, it's no, really no brainer that everybody wants imaging deeper, wider, and faster. So what's limiting us from seeing deep and wide? It's really tissue scattering. This is just my cell phone camera. I put a lens paper in the front. You take a shot. You see that light reach your camera, but on the other hand, there's no high resolution spatial information. You take the lens paper off, you can see this is my office in Clark Hall at Cornell. These are the big windows, which corresponds to this big blob of light on my camera. You look at the mouse brain and the cranial window. You remove the bone, put a piece of glass on the top. You really have to think about looking through a piece of tofu or a piece of cheese, depending on your cultural background. You have absorption, scattering, and all those things. The technology we use is called multi-photon microscopy, which actually was invented at Cornell in 1990. This is the only time in my life I always wish I'm a few years older, because I joined Professor Webb's group in 1992, just two years behind. So why multi-photon is really good? This is a photo convinced me to join this field 25, 27 years ago. You can see one photon fluorescence. This is the focal plane where you have a high spatial resolution. Of course, you see a lot of fluorescence above and below. So one photon excitation is well known. It's not spatially confined. When you go to a two photon excitation, because the fluorescence goes as the intensity squared, you can see that only the focus gives you significant fluorescence excitation. There's not much above and not much below. So in some sense, imaging deep in a scattering tissue is really simple. All you need to do is to form a sharp focus in 3D. Once you can do that, you can just scan this point in three dimension. You can form an image. Time is space. So it's a really simple idea. Now, of course, two-photon microscopy couldn't go infinitely deep, right? What is the problem? It's really the tissue scattering. You have to look at the amount of photons reaching the focus if you focus your ultra-fast beam into the brain tissue. Here, the aspect ratio, you have a one millimeter depth and only about one micron focus. Diffraction limited focus, resolution is roughly the wavelength. Right? If you think about this, this is really like a sniper shooting a target, shooting a person from like 1,000 meters away. You have about one millimeter versus one micron. It's like a sniper shooting a person from 1,000 meters away. If the bullet hit anything between the target and your gun, your chance of hitting that target is essentially zero. This is the same thing here. As the photon coming in, converging onto the focus, if the photon is scattered, its chance of reaching the small little target is essentially zero. That makes the signal going down exponentially as a function of imaging depth. So that's really a problem. It's an exponential wall as you want to go deep in the tissue. And this is not just hand waving. You can see the experimental results. These are brain vasculature in the mouse brain. And you can see fluorescent signal as a function of imaging depth. You can see that in the semi-log plot, vertical axis is the log scale. This is horizontal. Is the depth is the linear scale. In a semi-log plot, you can see that the signal goes down in a straight line, meaning signal goes down exponentially as a function of depth. So idea is really quite simple. We want to use long wavelength to reduce the effect of scattering, use three photon excitation to increase this nonlinear confinement. Just go through the logic a little bit. Why do we use long wavelength? If you look at the brain tissue, photons going to the brain, it experiences absorption. Shorter wavelength, blood absorption dominate. Long wavelength, word absorption dominate. On the other side, you see that Water absorption has those nice windows for transparency. You look at tissue scattering, this is like why the sunset is red and the sky is blue. Longer wavelength reduces tissue scattering very naturally. This is scattering coefficient. 
the lower the coefficient, the less the scattering. If you combine those two effects together, absorption, exponential decay, and scattering is also exponential decay. If two exponential functions multiply together, you can define this new length, which we call effective attenuation length. The in inverse of this is the attenuation coefficient. It's shown over here. You combine the effect of, of uh, absorption and scattering. I think this laser point is running out of photons already. So uh, you can see this peak is corresponding to the water absorption peak over there. And the lowest attenuation point is very clearly at about 1,300 nanometer and 1,700 nanometer. Now that's just a simple sort of hand-waving argument. You can do experiment, you will see that it works really well for experimental data at 800 nanometer, 1,300 nanometer, and 1,700 nanometer. And lately we also confirmed that this water absorption peak does exist in the brain. Okay, so this very first order method works really quite well for understanding how brain absorption and scattering goes. So it's really a trade-off between tissue absorption and tissue scattering. And the best window for tissue penetration is clearly at about 1300 and 1700 nanometer. Now this is interesting because if you think about this trade-off, it's actually quite universal. I spent five years in telecom working on fiber optic transmission. You can see this is the optical fiber attenuation curve. Wavelengths too short, too much scattering. Wavelengths too long, too much absorption. You compromise between the two, you find the best window we know is about 1.55 microns over here. You compare this with the optical with the brain, they look really quite similar. So in that regard, fiber and the brain are really quite equivalent. And I spent five years in telecom, it's not completely wasted. Another idea is why do we go three photon excitation? As I mentioned before, it's all about forming a sharp focus in 3D. Because if you have non-confined excitation, you scan this thing, most of your photons coming from above and below the focus. You go to two photon, you can see very nice, only the focus is bright. But what if, this is no scattering over here, this is just a fluorescing solution. What if I pour some scattering beads into the solution? Look at what happens. See, this is what happens. Once you start adding beads into the solution, you can see this is the focus, a little bit bright, but away from the focus, you can see this background coming up. If you scan this point in 3D, you can see the signal from the focus could be easily overwhelmed by, the, by these uh, background generation along the surface of the brain. You go to three photon excitation, you can see only the focus is bright again. You get back your confinement. It's all about a sharp focus in 3D. Now, it's just not long wavelength, because you can also do long wavelength two photon excitation. You can see that you go long wavelength two photon excitation, focus is bright over here, away from the focus is also lots of light generated. So in that regard, if you want to image deep in a scattering tissue, with the tissue non-sparsely labeled, the advantage of three photon excitation compared to two photon excitation is very similar to two photon excitation compared to one photon excitation. And once again, it's all about spatial confinement in 3D. So in this case, we are very lucky. We have two ideas, long wavelength windows and three photon excitation, right? And these actually works out very nicely hand in hand. The reason is that if you want to use long wavelength window, 1.3, 1.7 microns, you want to do two photon excitation. Your photon energy is just not quite enough. You don't have many fluorophores to look at. If you add a photon, you can see it works really quite nicely. Three photon excitation, blue green fluorophores, for example, green fluorescent protein works very well at 1300 nanometer. If you look at orange and red fluorophores, you can also see that Three photon excitation of those four of us works very nicely with 1700 nanometer excitation. So in this case, we are very lucky. These two ideas are very synergistic. They essentially form one idea to do deep and fast imaging. Now, this idea is not very new in a sense that this is the work I did in grad school in 1996, as you can see. We already published a paper for three photon imaging. In this case, a DAPI stained DNA. You can see the chromosome structure in 3D. We can already do that. So what is the problem? The problem is that the cross-section or the probability of three photon excitation is really low, right? Astronomically low, as you can see this number over here. So what we realize is that nonlinear excitation, of course, depending on the duty cycle of your laser. For two photon excitation, the signal goes at the inverse of the laser duty cycle. For three photon excitation, because it's higher order nonlinear excitation, 
it goes to duty cycle inverse squared. If you look at what we did in grad school 1996, as you can see that this is the laser we used. Now for a few milliwatts in the brain, that's what you do. You can see three photon signal is way below the two photon signal, by maybe a factor of 1,000. And that's why in this image, we already use 50 milliwatts of average power to look at a completely transparent sample. If you scale this to image the mouse brain, say at 500 microns deep, you kind of need about five watts of average laser power. And the mouse is hard to stay alive when you put five watts of power in the brain. But if you go to three photon, what you need to do, you can see that you have to reduce the duty cycle of your laser. If you reduce your duty cycle of your laser by a factor of 100 or so, you can see, even with a few milliwatts on the surface of the brain, you can get comparable signal to conventional two photon excitation. So what you need is a different engine for this imaging technology. So we need a laser that's lower repetition rate, right? Something like uh, megahertz, energetic pulses, few hundred nanojoule, and hopefully sub 100 femtosecond pulse width. So about six, seven years ago, we started to pursue this idea. We looked around excitation sources at those two windows, 1300 and 1700 nanometer. And of course, life has it, you don't have a laser in those wavelengths. So what we did is that we go back to our telecom roots and leveraged our soliton technique called a soliton cell frequency shift in a photonic crystal rod. We launched a 1550 laser over here in the red and shift it using soliton cell frequency shift to 1700 nanometer. During this process, you also cleans up the pulse and also sharpens the pulse. So for the first time, we can actually have a very energetic pulse at, at the right repetition rate at the wavelength we want. And of course, another issue is the minor detail sometimes, I think. You don't have long wavelength optics, right? You need a long wavelength optics to be compatible with those two windows. So what we did is we talked to Olympus at the time, so made us some nice lenses, custom lenses. The first one coming in at 2012, the price is roughly a Porsche, very expensive. And now you can buy one for a price of a Honda. It's commercialized. So with the right laser, you can see that three photon excitation is actually practical because you can see with only a few milliwatts in the surface of the brain, you can do three photon excitation of Texas red labeled blood vessels. You can look at third harmonic generation myelin with only a few milliwatts. And with 20, 30 milliwatts, we can image all the way down to the hippocampus. You can see in this mouse in vivo, red fluorescent protein labeled neurons, different layers of neurons and the white matter area called external capsule and the hippocampal layers over here. So the advantage is really real. We can do a head-to-head -head comparison. We inject two different dyes, uh, fluorescein and Texas, and fluorescein dyes into the brain, right? With two different wavelengths, 920 nanometer for two photon and 1300 nanometer for three photon. So same dyes in the brain, just look at the performance. So you can see for two photon excitation, again, same mouse brain, same microscope, everything the same, except two different excitation modality, two photon and three photon. You can see for the two photon excitation, in addition to the vasculature, which is labeled, should be very bright. Away from the vasculature, you can see that outside is still quite bright. That's the non-localized excitation cause you. You add a photon there, you can see blood vessel is very bright, outside is completely dark. So clearly that tells you it's not dye leakage, but if the dye leakage, this should also be bright in the three photon modality. You can look at transgenic mouse, in this case, G-camp labeled, two photon excitation, three photon excitation. For the bright neurons, you can see, looked very much the same. For the dim neurons, it's very hard to see over here. Most telling is this blood vessel over here. The blood vessel is not labeled in this case, should be completely dark. But in two photon excitation, you can see that you can barely make out the shadow of a blood vessel. In three photon excitation, the blood vessel is still completely dark. So to summarize the advantage, by going to a high order long wavelength, what you have is much better contrast, about a factor of 100 in contrast ratio. And in addition, if you go deep enough, because the longer wavelength we use, we can actually also achieve much better signal excitation in this case. So to do real biology, of course, we have to have a different laser than the one we used with the soliton cell frequency shift. So for the longest time, about three, four years, we've been fighting with this laser. I call the laser made for laser jocks. 90% of the time, laser's not working. For 10% of the time, laser's working, you've got to do all your experiment. That's what you do. Around 2016, a nice OPCPA system come along. Still a little bit flaky at the time, but at least it works much better than this type of laser. It works 90% of the time, and 10% of the time, you have to go back to the factory. 
And now we have even better laser. The performance is very much matching for the imaging requirement, but you have to be somewhat rich to have a laser like this. And lots of people are competing and different companies are making similar lasers. Hopefully, the cost and performance of laser will both go better and better. So show you some results what we can do. This imaging the entire cortical column of a mouse over here, shown here, and showing you 15 or 18 sections all the way from the surface of the brain down to the white matter, separating the neocortex and the subcortical regions of the brain. Greens are the neurons, the green donuts are the neurons, the purple are third harmonic generation, myelin and blood vessels, and this little flashing shows the neuronal activity. When the neurons are actively firing action potential, the neurons will flash dark and bright, right, like this. And these are neuronal activities throughout the cortical column in a mouse in vivo. We want to go deeper than the cortical column. See, this is the mouse brain anatomy. The cortical column over here, the external capsule is the white matter, which is much more scattering than the gray matter. That's why it's white. And we want to see the hippocampus. It turns out that this little white matter is about 2.5 times as scattering as the gray matter. So it's much tougher to go through the white matter. And showing you here imaging results, three-dimensional reconstruction, roughly matching the area of the neurons. The white matter showing up over here is the purple, third harmonic generation of the myelin. And this showing the movie, the fly through. You can see imaging depth, scale about 50 microns, purple third harmonic, the green dots are the neurons, G-camp labeled. You can see the mining layers flying by, which is over here. And a little bit of time going through this layer, then you see the hippocampus CA1 region of the neurons coming by. And of course, we want to watch for neuronal activity. So in this case, we scan the same layer of neuron at a very high speed. We can watch mouse thinking very deeply in this case. And the movie is sped up by a factor of 60. And you could repeatedly image in the same region of the neuron over and over again just to make sure they're still alive and it gives the right performance, right activity level. Now, everything I showed you so far, imaging through a cranial window. We remove the bone on the top, put a piece of window to look through it. We can also image it through the bone. In this case, we peel back the skin. The bone is unthinned and intact. You can still see single neuron resolution. Each donut shape is a neuron, the dark region, the nucleus. The dye is only expressed in the cytosol, so the nucleus is dark. And you can see neuronal activity of these neurons labeled in the image on the left. You can take movies over eight to nine sessions over a period of about a month or five weeks. Spatial resolution is still quite good. You can see this is one neuronal process. Lateral resolution is about one micron. Axial resolution is about five microns. Certainly more than enough to see single cell resolution. And through, in this case, as unthing that intact mouse skull. Zebrafish, this is sort of a favorite subject for neuroscientists because most people look at zebrafish over here, the larva zebrafish. When the zebrafish is a few days old, they're completely transparent. You can do light sheet microscopy, you can see the entire brain activity at very high time resolution. But what about adult fish like this? This is three month old fish, right? Can you see through the scale, the scalp, and into the brain and go through it? I show you some results uh, done with my collaborator, Joe Fetchel from Cornell Neuroscience. This is intact zebrafish at 90 day old, three months old. This is the region we imaged, called the telecephalon area of the brain. You can see purple, third harmonic generation neural fibers. Greens are the neurons labeled. You can see this midline crossed by is all corresponding to this little midline over here. So now we can image the adult zebrafish through the, again, intact adult zebrafish, scale, skull, into the brain all the way through the telecephalon area. As that opens up an opportunity to imaging the development process, for example, from newborn all the way to grown up. So last few minutes, 10 minutes, I'll give you a new idea we have, we haven't published yet, how to image not just deep, but also much faster. Now, to want to image it faster, you would think you want to scan the beam really, really fast. Of course, that's necessary but not quite sufficient because if you scan really, really fast, what happens is that eventually you don't have any photons at each pixel, right? So this is a fundamental photon budget problem. You need the photons per neuron per frame to measure activity accurately. If you don't have any, any photons per pixel, you can't do anything, any measurement. But tissue damage limits how much power you can put into the mouse brain. And that means the number of photons you get out is also limited. In some sense, if I have to develop a mouse, you can put infinite laser powers in it. Lots of problems naturally resolved. So what you need to do is actually perform so-called 
most photon efficient imaging. You want every photon into the brain, every photon from the laser to provide useful information for you. It can lower the tissue damage, but also lower the laser power requirement. So how do we do this? So if you look at, again, the mouse cortical column, look at neurons in the mouse cortical column over here. Again, the green dots are the neurons. You can see neurons only occupy about 10% volume, or a little bit less than 10% of volume of the brain. If you're only interested in neuronal activity, that means you want to put all your photon budget onto those neurons. So I'll show you a new laser we just created. It enables random access imaging, where all the laser pulses is gonna naturally land on those neurons to speed up the Im imaging process. So normal imaging is like this. You have a laser, right? And you come out with a periodic pulse train, the Moloch laser. You scan the laser beam on the sample like this, and you form an image. Showing you here is a neuron. You can see that's the problem here, right? Because lots of laser pulses are landing outside of this neuron. If neurons were the information you want, you can see that you're wasting a lot of, neuro lot of pulses. Not only you waste your laser pulses, but also these pulses do tissue damage. So both are not good. What you want to do is to feedback the structural information into this laser, right? So you can adapt the laser to the sample under investigation. So we call this an adaptive excitation source. Instead of firing a regular periodic pulse train, what we do is firing a pulse burst. And this burst is synchronized with my laser scanning mechanism. And when it lands on the sample, it naturally lands on your neuron. Okay, very simple idea. But what you need to do is actually to create this laser directly to fire this pulse burst, so you don't waste any laser power. So this is some details how this happens. We use a chirp pulse amplification system. We use this pulse picker, normally you use a pulse picker in the CPA system. In this case, we use a analog-driven fiber electro-optic modulator, okay? Same as the CPA system where Donald Strickland and Jerome Moreau got a Nobel Prize in physics this year. Very, it's essentially the same idea, except that this modulator is changed to analog modulation, which is driven directly from the sample information. Just one minor detail, that is, since now the laser is no longer firing a uniform pulse train, right, periodic pulse train, what you have is so-called gain transient, okay? Essentially, the amplifier is like turning it on at all time, right? You have a turning on process in all those gaps between your pulse bursts, okay? So how do we overcome that? So that's the situation. In fact, it almost stopped us. We thought this idea would never work. So if you want to have a uniform pulse string like this, so naturally putting a pulse string like this, you go through a fiber amplifier. So what happens because of the gain transient, you can see that the gain of the leading pulse is higher. As you go into the pulse train, the gain goes slower. So you actually get a very non-uniform pulse train output. That's called a gain transient. I think telecom is quite well known for burst mode uh, fiber amplification, uh, optical amplification. So what you need to do is pre-emphasis, right? What you want to do is this. You want to come in with a pulse train already emphasized in a reverse way so that when you get out, it's exactly right. It's a very simple idea. So how do you do that, right? So again, we use a very simple negative feedback loop. It turns out to be, works really well. You just take the output, right, and feed into the input. If the pulse is too high, you make it lower. If the pulse is too low, you make the input higher. So it's an extremely simple idea. And you can see it works wonders. We just let the loop, let the light goes in and out in the amplifier for 30-ish loops. You can see the fluctuation of the pulse peak goes down as it goes the number of loops. It starts to be very non-uniform, but in the end, you can see it gets very uniform, right? And this is the pulse pattern input, and the output, you can see, gets essentially a flat pulse peak height. And if you have a laser like this, you can do really wonderful jobs, in this case, we can do two photon excitation. Of course, it's a laser source we created. You can do two photon, you can also do three photon excitation. So you first find the neurons first, and now this is the bursting case, okay? And you can record the fluorescence fluctuation as a function of time for each individual neurons. And you can see the index is very deep, 680 microns deep, very big field of view, 700 microns, video rate, and also at a very low power level, 13 milliwatts. By doing this simple modulation technique, we can reduce the power consumption and the power input into the brain by about 30 times. You can see if you, want, if you don't do this, you need about almost 400 milliwatts in the mouse brain, and once again, that's not physiologically possible. 
Now this, again, it's a laser. It works for any excitation, two photon or three photon. It works for all different microscopes you have. All I need is just a pixel sync. And we can do three photon excitation. Again, structural imaging, find out the neurons, the green dots are the neurons, and now we can burst the laser, right? And now you can see the flash of the mouse. The, the laser is bursting, and it can record activities of each individual neurons. And we can compare that very easily because it's a simple switch, right? You turn the modulation on, you turn the modulation off. You can see if you turn the modulation off, this is the laser, this is the information you get. Signal to noise ratio really looked quite crappy over here. You turn the modulation back on, you can see the signal to noise ratio is significantly improved on the right. Okay? And you can also image blood vessels. In this case, the region of interest are just blood vessels. We can image really deep, about 1.1 millimeter in the mouse brain at twice the video rate, right? We just look at the XY frame. We, we segment out those blood vessels. And you can actually see individual red blood cells flowing by. These gaps, the dark gaps, are each individual red blood cells flowing by through the blood vessels. And this movie is slowed down by a factor of two. And of course, we want to need to push into biology. You know, I'm a technology developer. If biologists don't use my technique, it's kind of a useless thing, right? The laser is commercially available. Okay, the laser is commercially available from different companies. And performance is more or less matching what we need for three-photon imaging at long wavelength. The microscope optics are available, too, from different companies. And the microscope itself now is available from several different vendors. So what we need now is fearless biologists who can really want to test those new techniques. So we want to close the gap between technology development and the biological science advances, right? In my lab, it's really a toy. I do demonstration experiment. I don't really do any biological experiments. And the good thing is about 30 labs have now started on this journey, adapt this technology to, take, uh, to do imaging with. And it's interesting. So sometimes it feels like it's very satisfying, but also a little bit worrying that some of those labs are not doing better than I do in this case. So just a quick summary, uh, opportunities for three photon imaging at the long wavelength window of 1.3 and 1.7 microns. One imaging very deep, so you're imaging a mouse hippocampus, deep layers of rats, I didn't show you the results, and imaging the primate monkeys. The brain is much bigger, it needs to go much deeper. Imaging relatively deep in, in densely labeled sample. In this case, because of contrast improvement, even if you don't want to go very deep, you still might want to consider this technique. And penetration through highly scattering layer. I showed you a couple of examples of, one is through the mouse skull, the other is through adult zebrafish. When the samples have a highly scattering layer, three photon long wavelength really helps. And we're also looking to application imaging through thick dura of a monkey in this case. And lastly, I show you, an adaptive excitation laser concept that allows you to the most photon efficient fast imaging of two and three photon. And all of these, as you can see, ultra fast laser is really the key to make all these possible. So lastly, acknowledgement. Uh, this work is mostly done by half of my group, two grad students and three postdocs, and funding mostly from NIH, but also with some luck from DARPA, IARPA, and also the NSF Neural Next. So thank you very much. <laughs>